Heavenly Father, we're still um, riding high from our Easter celebration when we once again recalled in a unique and special worship service the fact that you rose from the dead. Not that that's not important every day of our lives, but on Easter Sunday we particularly rise and celebrate that victory of life over death. And Father, we, we name that in each one of our lives. That's, that's the hope. That's what gives us the strength to get up every morning and face the challenges of the world because we know we are more than conquerors. We are victors in life over death. Thank you for that. We ask that you would meet us here this hour and that you would teach us, that you would point our hearts and our minds and our attention to the words of Paul that instruct us in the way of faith. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. We are on chapter 8. I am so excited. This is, this is my chapter. I love this chapter. So... Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. We, we already talked about the first two verses, and we'll just kind of touch on them again, but, you know, we'll, we'll keep going on. Let's kind of regroup a little bit, and, um, you know, so we can re reclaim our focus as, as we're going through what Paul is trying to tell us. Chapter 8. Remember, we enter into chapter 8 with no condemnation, and we leave chapter 8 with no separation, and in between, the Holy Spirit's doing His thing in our lives and in the world. It's just a great chapter. So, one of the things that's important here as we talk about Paul's letter is this idea about the Torah. So, we've been talking about that. So, remember, the Torah is another word for law. Not in every case, but in lots of cases, the law, when our Bible talks about the law, you could substitute the word Torah for that. Although the Torah is specifically, normally, talked about as the first five books of the Bible written by Moses, you know, called the Torah. I'm suggesting that we can best understand Torah or the law as we relate it to covenant. I think that's one of the big one of the big messages that we need to take from this. So before the law or the Torah of Moses, remember the law was given to Moses before that, there was actually another Torah or a law that was associated with Abraham. Abraham abided by some, some kind of law. He abided in faith in some sort of law that led to a covenant between him and God that is still being fulfilled today. That Torah is actually the foundation of all faith. That's why we talk about Father Abraham, the Father Abraham of our faith. If we don't have the faith of Abraham, then we have an issue, even today as Christians. I mean, he's our father of faith as well, because we've been grafted onto that tree. The Torah of Moses came as a set of rules that got greatly enhanced by the religious leaders. Right? Over 300, I don't know, 316 or 318 of those, to be specific. The Torah was to identify one's position with God. These are the things that are expected. So when these things don't happen, then that's considered to be a rebellion. Or you have broken the law, which takes you out of relationship with God, which is what the sacrifices were all about. The sacrificial system 
was to try to mend that broken relationship, you know, and try to keep us in contact or keep us connected with God, but never brought us into full right relationship with God. We were out of covenant relationship, all right? And so we were headed toward death. The law was not intended and it had no power to save us from that rebellion, to save us in that condition when we were separated from God. Unfortunately, that's what the Jewish religious leaders thought the law was for, and so that's what they taught the people. So now Paul is looking at this, being fully um, schooled in that thinking, and now that he knows Christ and sees the life of Christ, and he looks back at his schooling, he says, eh, we didn't quite get it right. So he's trying to correct that now. Without some redemption from the law of Moses, founded in Abraham, we're still going to die. Because keeping the law doesn't help us. So Paul is adamant that whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, you needed to be saved. You needed a Savior. So the law of Moses, the Torah, and the law of the Spirit is how we reclaim the covenant relationship through the sacrifice, through the redemption of the Messiah, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Yahusha. Right? And that now is what guides us. Right? Christ brought us back in line with the Torah, the law, and has given us the Spirit as a law, those two combine, and we recapture the faith of Abraham according to the covenant relationship that God made at the very beginning. You will be my people. I will be your God. So here's the deal. One does not live the Torah in order to be saved. That's a pretty radical statement to the Jews. You don't live the Torah in order to be saved. You are saved in order to live the Torah. See the difference? If we are not saved, we will not be able to live according to the Torah, to the law. All right? So the Ten Commandments do matter, and there are factions in the Christian church that would say, hey, you know what? We're done with that. But that's over with. We, we don't, that doesn't apply to us anymore. We don't live by the Ten Commandments. So I'm one of the ones who say, that's wrong. I mean, God's covenant is God's covenant. You don't break God's covenant ever at any time for any reason. So God gave the law for a reason. We are expected to keep the law to abide by God's law. But we're to do that as people who choose to live in covenant with God through His Messiah, Jesus Christ. That's how we keep the law, by His Spirit inside us. We follow the Spirit inside us who then lines us up with the law of Moses in our lives. That's how the Ten Commandments are still, or the law, or the Torah, is still important in our lives. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a new resource that you might not be familiar with, and it's called the Complete Jewish Bible. 
very interesting resource. In a lot of ways, I find this very powerful and helpful. It's the Bible written from a Jewish perspective that accepts Jesus as the um, Messiah, the Yeshua, Messiah, Messiah, Meshua. I'm going to read to you the first eight verses from this Bible of the chapter 8. And I want you to hear it. Based upon what we just said, I want you to hear how they interpret, how they translate the first eight verses. Therefore, there is no longer any condemnation awaiting those who are in union with the Messiah Yeshua. Why? Because the Torah of the Spirit, which produces this life in union with the Messiah Yeshua, has set me free from the Torah of sin and death. Coming from Moses. For what the Torah could not do by itself because it lacked the power to make the old nature cooperate, God did by sending his own son as a human being with a nature like our own sinful one, parentheses, but without sin, end of parentheses. God did this in order to deal with sin, and in so doing, he executed the punishment against sin in human nature, so that the just requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in us who do not run our lives according to what our old nature wants, but according to what the Spirit wants. For those who identify with their old nature set their minds on the things of the old nature. But those who identify with the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Having one's mind controlled by the old nature is death. But having one's mind controlled by the Spirit is life and shalom, or peace. For the mind controlled by the old nature is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's Torah. Indeed, it cannot. Thus, those who identify with their old nature cannot please God. So, that's a great a great translation and understanding of those verses. So let's use our translations that we have now, and let's go back and pick up those verses and look at them a little bit more in detail. All right, so <clears throat> that's what I was just reading from right there, the complete Jewish Bible. I recommend it if you're into trying to find um, new new translations that help. Um, if, you, if you're one of the ones that like to compare translations, this is a great translation to include in your list. Romans 8.3 For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now, what the law, the Torah, in our flesh, right, our human flesh, could not do. That's exactly what Paul is talking about. Because the Jewish people at that point would think, eh, the law, everything was about the law. The law was, that was all in all. Paul's trying to help them pull away from that. See, not so much. How can the law make us right without God? 
or make us right with God. How can the law save me? It can't. It can't provide redemption for me. It never could. It was never supposed to. So this is what Paul, in his um, brilliant understanding now from his Pharisee training and his relationship and training by the Holy Spirit, since he became a believer in Christ, he is now reconstructing for them what, what they're really dealing with, how they really need to be in right relationship with God. The law was to keep us in covenant, but our flesh could not follow that law. We fell short, we abandoned, we broke the law. So, whether they had the law or didn't have the law, difference between the Gentiles and the Jews, it didn't matter. The law was being broken. So you're no better off than the Gentiles, basically, is what Paul is saying. You're at odds with the law because you don't keep the law perfectly. You need someone to save you. So, the law makes us aware that we have a problem. That's what the law was supposed to do. Instead, the law made them feel, the Jews, feel secure in what they had. Paul says, no, the law was supposed to show you you're, you're insecure, you're very insecure, because you have not kept the law. And so you need help. The flesh cannot keep the law. That's the power of sin. The power of sin is in this earth suit, this fleshly body. And as long as this flesh is alive, and that means the old person, prior to our redemption, this is who we were, this is part of who we were, prior to our redemption, prior to us being righteous dead. Remember that word that we coined? All right, when we were made right, we were righteous before God. Right? As long as this flesh is alive, we need help. We have a problem. So our spirit and our soul have been redeemed. Our physical body has not been redeemed. What are we waiting for? Paul tells us later on here in this chapter. We won't get to it today, I don't think. We'll get to it next week. But what is it? We're waiting for what? We're waiting for the redemption of our what? Our bodies. Our soul and our spirit have already been redeemed. This earthly body never gets redeemed. When is this body redeemed? When this one dies and I get a new glorified body that is completely redeemed. Now, now I am a totally new person, fit to live in the kingdom of God. So, we need help. Where does that help come from? Well, praise the Lord, God sent help through His Son, who came from heaven, being one with God, in the likeness of sinful flesh, meaning He became flesh. He took on human flesh form. He was in our likeness. Why is he in our likeness? Well, Christ is in the flesh, but he did not abandon the Torah. He never broke covenant with God. That's why it's the likeness of our flesh. But he did in his flesh what we were never able to do in our flesh. He stayed in perfect covenant. That is what made him eligible to sacrifice himself for our sins. Because he was without sin in human flesh. And so he offered himself as that sacrifice. So let's look at a couple of verses. It's not just, not just in Romans. Paul, Paul addresses this numerous other places. So look at Philippians chapter 2. I'm a, I'm, I'm not, I could go into a whole big thing there, but let's just read it. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, 
That's pretty specific, right? I mean, in our new creation, right, we need the same mind. Who, though he was in the form of God, meaning in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, right? That's what John says. Though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, he left heaven, he left that existence, taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness in the flesh, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Now why do we say that? Because technically, Jesus Christ never should have died, right? Think about that. Death is the what? Wages of sin. Christ never sinned. So what? He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Why? Because he took on the sins of the world. That was something that he was sent to do, and he obeyed that. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, whether in heaven or on earth or under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's the New Testament version of that. What's the Old Testament version of that? Well, Isaiah chapter 53. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. That's that idea about being righteous did, right? Uh, make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for those transgressors. Right. So, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament version of what happened in Jesus Christ. Jesus was condemned, there is therefore now no condemnation, for me. So, one of the translations in the uh, verse 1, I just love this. It's kind of fun. I'm going to play with it a little bit with you so you can kind of think about it. It might stick in your mind. We're going to refer to it here numerous times this week and next week. There is then now no condemnation. That's a perfectly good translation. There is then now no. Then now no. Then now no. Then now no. <laughs> Okay? Then now no condemnation. That is just an incredible opening statement to this line of thought. And by the way, this is a great way to wake up every morning. There is then now no condemnation for me. What's the then? Well, the then was, hey, that's the prior life, right? That's the wrath of God life. You know, then, you know, you, you've got this issue. You have, you have broken covenant. You are separated. You are out of, out of, you need help. That's the then. What's the now? Christ has come. He died on the cross. He has bore your sins. So that's the then. This is the now. What does that mean? There's no condemnation for me. All that condemnation fell on him. None of it falls on me. Then now no condemnation for me. That's just I, I, I love that. You know, 
Then now know. Just go around repeating that. Then now know. That's my life. Then now know. All right, verse 4. So that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So that's the now, right? The now, no. There's no condemnation for me. Why? Because I am in Christ Jesus. He is in me. I am not walking according to my old man anymore. I am living according to my new creation. Right? And so the requirement has already been fulfilled. There is a just requirement for the breaking of the law, the breaking of the covenant, which is sin. What is the just requirement for the breaking of the law? The wages of sin is yeah. death. There has to be a death. There has to be a death, which was the whole point of the Old Testament sacrifices. Right? That was a visual reminder that the wages of sin is death. What was the only way? Good morning. Welcome. I'm Thank you for so coming. Sorry. <laughs> What is the only way that God would overlook in the Old Testament? Would overlook sins? Was when they offered the sacrifices of the animal. They would place their hand on the animal, right? Transferring their guilt, their blame on that animal, and then they would kill the animal. Well, God would overlook it at that point. That's why the Christ, you know. Christ is once for all. They had to keep repeating that with the animals because an animal's sacrifice is not worthy. But the sacrifice of Christ, once and for all, he took our sins. Now it's a done deal. Now we're erased. So, the just requirement, you see, is worked in us. It's not worked by us. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. So if I don't have Christ in me, then that penalty has not been paid for my sins. And I'm still walking in the way of the old man, and I'm going to die. That requirement was worked in me, not by me. There's nothing I can do. I didn't earn that. I, I, didn't, I can't earn my salvation. I can't redeem myself. It's impossible. I need the help. Is walking according to the Spirit then, we're supposed to walk according to the Spirit with Christ in me, right? Is walking according to the Spirit works? Is that, is that, am I working there? Are those my works? And the answer is yes, it is. But what are those works? Not what we normally call works, right? Normally what we call works is that we're earning something. I work for my wages. See, that's, that direct, that's not what this kind of works are. What are these works? These works fall back onto, catch this now, the covenant relationship. My work is to live in covenant relationship with God. Keeping the right covenant relationship with God. That's why, that's what it is now. Did I earn that covenant relationship with God? No. I was given that covenant relationship with God. It was restored to me. But what's my job now? My job is to live in that covenant relationship. How do I do that? Well, by the Holy Spirit. Where did the Holy Spirit come from? Jesus Christ. We're going to look at that. All right? So let's follow through with that. Let's, there are... A, just, a, just, ah, let me try that one more time. There is a distinction between God's works and my works. God's works are of salvation. All right? From the standpoint that He... He provides my salvation for me. That's the work He did. Then there are my works of salvation. That's when I agree to live 
according to the law of being in a right covenant relationship. My works are a result of my salvation. God's works are a gift of my salvation. I work at what it means to be in Christ. What does that mean? If I'm in Christ, what does that mean? Well, that means I'm in the right relationship with God. So what's my work? My work is to live that out. That's the same as living in Abraham's covenant. Yep. That's according to Abraham's faith. God loved Abraham's faith. He reckoned it to him. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. Right? So when I'm in Christ, it's not as if that the law doesn't exist. To the contrary, to be in Christ, I have to live according to the law. To be a member of Christ's body. Right? That's the post-salvation understanding of being in Christ. Those of us who are in Christ belong to Christ's body. And we call that the church. Those are the people that have been set aside. They live according to the Torah, covenant with God. My works have nothing to do with me then, right? I can never take credit for any of my works. Why? Because it's Christ in me through the Holy Spirit by which I do those works. Listen again to Philippians, this time in chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition and conceit. Well, where does that come from? My flesh, right? That's where my flesh, that's the old man, that's the old self. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. What's that humility? Well, that's the understanding that you've been gifted with something. Right? Be humble in the fact that you didn't, you didn't earn a thing. You've been gifted with something. So you've been, you know, when, you, when you're given an extravagant gift, what does that do to you? How do you respond to that? Well, it's about time you gave me that. No. no. You know, we're just like, we're, our breath is taken away. We're, we're so humble. I can't believe you would do that for me. Exactly. That's what we're talking about here. All right? So that's the humility that would allow us to regard, catch that word, regard others as better than ourselves. People, no one's better than me. Right? We're, we're all equal. We're all the same. Right? I'm simply willing in my spirit, in my humble spirit, to regard others greater than myself. Isn't that what Christ did on the cross? Yeah. He regarded me as important enough to do this. Was he better than me? Uh, yeah. So, Remember the illustration of the soup bone? That applies here. Remember? You put the bone in the soup, you know, but then you don't serve soup with a bone in it. Right. You just pull all the goodness of that bone out, and then the soup has all the goodness of that bone in it. Here's another passage. Galatians. Let's look at this. Live by the Spirit. So this just shows you the consistency that Paul, as Paul writes to the early believers. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, in order to prevent you from doing what you want. Bingo! Where did we just see that? Chapter 7. How come I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things I do want to do? That's because this, there's this conflict, there's this war going back and forth. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject 
to the law. All right? What does that mean? It doesn't mean we can't keep the law. It's that we're not expecting that the law is going to do something for us. Now, the works of the flesh, okay, now we get serious here. And Paul lays out quite a list. We could add some to this, but what's the point? He does a good job. The works of the flesh, my old man, my nature, that, that um, disobeys the Torah, disobeys the law, are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like that. We get the point, don't we? So what is that? The works of the flesh. It is the flesh abandoning the covenant relationship and breaking the law. That's exactly what that is. Stop it. No. Come to Christ. Live by the Spirit. Don't live according to flesh. Live by the Spirit. I'm warning you, he continues, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't live like that and call yourself a kingdom dweller. Now, does that mean we'll never do those things? No. It says, are you living like that? Are you following that as your lifestyle? If you do, you will not be able to get into the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Great. What does he say? Against these there is no law. Why? Because these things keep the law. Do you catch that? That is just so powerful. Where do we get the fruit of the Spirit? From the Spirit, right? From the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And where do we get the Holy Spirit? From Christ. He says, I will ask the Father and He will send you the Spirit. Right? So it comes from the Father's end. So Christ, who did what? Who died for our sins, sends us the Spirit. You see, it's God. The Spirit is God in me. That's how I'm supposed to live. I'm supposed to stay in that covenant relationship now. And when I do that, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, and just self-control. Think about that list. If you live that list, you will not break the law. It's pretty powerful. Jesus did that. He was sent from the Father in the likeness of sinful flesh, meaning he was human, he had a fleshly body, he left the land of glory, he became like us, and yet he was without sin. Living that way took a lot of effort. That didn't just come natural. That didn't just happen. That wasn't automatic. That wasn't, he could not sin. He was in the flesh. He was like us. Could he have sinned? Yes. Did he live in such a way, did he purpose himself in such a way that he would not sin? Yes. Why? Because that was essential, that, that task ever before him, every day he woke up, that was a heavy thing on him. Why? Because if he did not live that way, he would not be able to deal with my sin. He would not be able to take my sin away. He sacrificed himself for our sins. That was an obedient sin offering. I love one of the modern songs that says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Is that powerful or what? When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. So, what does that mean? That makes the just requirement 
requirement fulfilled. The just requirement. When you make a law, it requires accountability. Otherwise, the law is pointless. Right? Make a rule. Make a law. You, know, you can think of other words that you want to today. Hey, that's one of the issues parents have, right? If you don't eat those peas, you're not going to get any dessert. And if they don't eat the peas, and they get the dessert, what does that teach them? <clears throat> and does that not mean you lied to the child? Right, your word is void. And God never what? Lies. God <laughs> never oh, lies. God. It doesn't matter whether you're a parent, whether you're a coach, whether you're a teacher, whether you're the mayor, whether you're the president, whether you're Congress, whether you're the Supreme Court, if there is a law, it's required that you have accountability. Otherwise, the whole thing falls apart. There had to be a just required death according to the law. The penalty of sin, the penalty for lawbreakers was that they were condemned to death. Now since God is a just and righteous God, there had to be a matching penalty for the breaking of the law. A price had to be paid. Otherwise, God would be what? A liar and would be unjust. So, in Christ, you see, that was fulfilled perfectly. So I give up my personal hope for keeping the law. I can't do that because I'm in this flesh. So what do I do? I turn to the perfect one who keeps the law to help me. And how does he provide that help? He has given me his Holy Spirit. My help is in the Holy Spirit. And so I don't rely on myself to keep the law. I am walking by the Spirit. That's what Paul's talking about now. This is what the law of the Spirit is in my life. All right. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. We live, how we live, our world view, how we view the world, where we get our values, what we accept as truth, the foundational principles, and the basic motivation that we use for all of our decision making falls in one of two categories. We are either in line with God or we are opposed to God. It's that simple. That's why the Christians are set apart. from. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. When we are aligned against God, we are living according to the flesh. But when we are aligned with God, we are living according to the Spirit. 
So we're supposed to set our minds. Paul told the Philippians to have the same mind as Christ. Remember, we just read that. That's how we're supposed to set our minds. Christ, Christ's mind was incredible. He had focus, concentration, priority, resolve, what? To live and complete his mission. It didn't just happen. It wasn't just like a lollying around every day. No, he worked at that. Paul told the Corinthians they're supposed to do what? Take every thought captive to Christ. Have the same mind as Christ. In our state as a new creation with Christ in me, since we belong to God now, we're in right relationship with God, that's where we need to set our minds. Paul comes back to this again in chapter 12. Remember what he says in chapter 12? Okay. Be, do not be conformed, but be transformed by the what? By the renewing of your mind. Same mind as Christ. So, we are either alive to the Spirit or not. And if we're born again, then we've been given the Spirit and we must walk according to the Spirit. So, verses 6 through 8. To set the mind on the flesh is death. We're living condemned. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. There is therefore now no condemnation. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. All right. Hold on. <clears throat> it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot submit to God's law. Because the flesh is weak. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is how important it is to find ourselves walking in the Spirit. If we do not have the Spirit, we will continue to break covenant, break God's laws, and live in hostility under God's wrath. That's when our minds are set on things that do not align with God. When this is our mindset, we simply cannot please God. And it's not just about the things we do. That's what Jesus was speaking about so emphatically at the Sermon on the Mount. If you do not commit adultery in the flesh, that's one thing. But if you want to commit adultery in the mind, you still have a problem. You're still breaking law. If, like David, you do commit adultery and you do kill a man, but that is not what is in your heart, God knows that. That's why we can't judge one another. And we don't understand each person's heart. So what does that show us? It shows us that even though we're walking by the Spirit, we can make mistakes. But what's the point? We're walking by the Spirit. That's the difference. It's not a game of semantics. It's the reality of our lives. The flesh is our old desire our sinful desires, are we going to submit to and be a slave 
to that sin or not? Or are we going to live following the one who saved us from sin? Look how Paul says this to the Ephesians, chapter 4. They are darkened in their understanding. Who would that be? People who are living a, according to the flesh. Alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and what? Hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And without going into huge detail, those are the types of verses that I read both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that speak so powerfully to me about what we are witnessing in our lives today in our country and in the world. This is not just progressives or liberals against conservatives and traditionalists. It's not just that. There is an evilness that is at work hardening people's hearts, blinding people, and therefore they are unable to connect or dialogue with those who don't agree with them. I would say in my lifetime, the primary change I have seen in Congress is the lack of statesmanship. When I was a younger boy, were there people in Congress who disagreed with each other? Yes. Absolutely. But what would they do? They would sit down across the table from one another and they would hash those out and this side would concede and this side would concede and they would come to an agreement about how we could move forward which would be a, a benefit and a progress. That takes statesmanship. I do not see any of that today. And so what do we have? We have a Congress that is dysfunctional. And when Congress is dysfunctional, our lives are affected. All right. Whew. Um, back to, this, to these verses. So evil, what I'm saying is evil abuses many minds. People who find themselves unable or unwilling to submit to God's law are people in darkness, right? Which helps you understand the Old Testament passage and what John says. What did Jesus come? Jesus came to a dark world. And how did he come? He came as light. So if you're blinded to the reality of God's supremacy and cannot believe in the spirit and oh there it is again so it's still it's still the battery okay. cannot believe in the spirit and the fruit of the spirit then we have this divisiveness and this irrationality and there's the children of wrath that are working in the world by the way that's that's probably the, um, the distinction, I would say, that we can make today. Um, 
between the two groups of people, remember we said those who can align with God and those who cannot align with God? How, how do you determine that? Will someone accept the sovereignty of God or not? It's really what it boils down to. Will you be able to confess and admit that God is absolutely sovereign, or do you want to hold out the fact that, well, you know, I have, I have a lot of control. I have, I have a lot of power. I, I can do, you know. So that's kind of like the dividing feature there. People who cannot accept that. Again, back to Ephesians. You were dead through trespasses and sins in which you once lived following in the course of this world. Following the ruler of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the flesh and our senses or lusts. And we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. What does that say to us? That says, don't get too hot to hear. That's part of that humbleness again, right? I mean, when I was saved, what I was saved from? That world. So we can't be too judgmental about that. We just have to remember where we came from. I think, and then we'll let this go for today. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to know where to quit here, to tell you the truth, but we'll just stop and pick it up next week because we're running out of time. Let me make this point, and then we'll quit. Where do we see this world at work, at its worst, in my opinion? And that is in our education system today. And I mean that sincerely. And my first degree was in teaching. So it's not like as if I want to bash teachers. I mean, I, 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 but listen, our education system today is the major source, the major resource in our children's lives for the fleshly mindset. They are teaching our children to follow the flesh. It's that simple. The school, what they're taught in school is the schools taunt the idea about a supreme creator God. That's ridiculous. We know that the world is billions of years old and has come into existence through millions of years of evolution. What is that? That's simply to say, no, there's not a supreme God. There's not a supreme being. Right? And they ridicule God's word. And they ridicule the people who teach and follow God's word. That is what the kids are learning in public school. And, quite honestly, a lot of private schools. Just because it's a private school, that's not an answer. Could be, but many times it's not. Truthfully, today, unfortunately, if you really want to educate your kids, what do you have to do? Teach them home. Home, school, them. It's unfortunate. And I want to make this point. This is a personal concept. I think this is the very place where we are facing the worst persecution of the church today. You and I, by and large, escape persecution. Eh, we have some. 
When our kids go to school, they face persecution, straight up persecution, eight hours a day, five days a week. We need to have more sensitivity to them about that. They have it much harder than we do. Minds that are set on the flesh cannot please God. This war is raging in our youth. In typical recovery language, what's the issue here? Well, when we're following the flesh, we're going to deceive ourselves. Isn't that what a person in recovery does? They begin minimizing and blaming and denying their problem, their situation. Oh, I, I, that's not really, I, I can control that. Well, I can quit any time I want to. So it's, it's not really, my, you know, I don't really have that big a problem. Yeah, sometimes, but, but by and large, I'm okay. I, I, I mean, they go through this whole charade. And until they do what? Until they admit that I am powerless to help myself, you will never be able to change their lives. Their lives will never come out of that. That's the fear and the danger I have for children in schools. That is the environment they're growing up in. Thanks be to God. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save us from that. Heavenly Father, yeah, these words were written 2,000 years ago, but Lord, we know full well the import and the impact of these words in our lives right now in 2022. Help us, Lord, to take the truth, the power of this truth, and bring it to bear in our lives, our families' lives, and the life of our community. In Christ's name, amen.